All right, welcome back, guys, to Surviving Hollywood. I'm Johnny Ray Diaz. I am Aaron Arnold. I am Austin Arnold. And uh, again, we are hanging out in quarantine, having fun. Uh, we just Zoomed with another fantastic guest, uh, actor Dilip Rao. Um, this guy has worked on some of the biggest movies you guys have probably seen, which is amazing, with three of the top filmmakers, of, I would say, of probably all time. Uh, he was in Inception. Chris Nolan, I mean, come on. Uh, he did Drag Me to Hell with Sam Raimi, Avatar with James Cameron. I mean, this dude is like literally working on like some of the best movies probably ever made. Yeah, yeah. And, and we're big fans of Dilip. And it was really cool to hear about how some of his first major projects was Avatar, was Drag Me to Hell, um, and then eventually Inception before either one of those or both of those came out. Just so you know, obviously he was working for years and studying for years, but just once he started going, um, and it was really cool to hear about what's it like working with Leonardo DiCaprio. He said he was pretty generous on set and he explained what that meant and, you know, what it's like working with Jim Cameron and all that stuff. It's pretty good. I really liked how he sort of gave a different perspective to uh, minorities' opportunity in Hollywood, specifically Indian American. Um, usually we just get to hear about you know, Johnny talking about Latinos in Hollywood. <laughs> now we got some new perspective, but in all Finally. seriousness, yeah, he, uh, it was, it was really interesting what he had to say. And that's about three quarters of the way through. Look forward to that. Yeah. Super, super well-spoken guy. Very intelligent. Um, I think he had a lot of valuable information for actors, um, even for filmmakers. So it was a, uh, it was a real pleasure talking to him and I think you guys will enjoy it. How's uh, how's your how's your quarantine hang going so far? <laughs> I mean, I I just basically felt like pretty good considering the complete insanity of what the alternative world is, right? Like it's it's so it's such a large change and it's so hard to stomach as a whole that you kind of have to deal with it in the moment. And in some ways, maybe that's a gift, but um, you know, it's a very trying, weird time. But generally, I think it's been all right. What do you What have you been doing to kind of pass the time, or what do you What's your, some of your hobbies at home? I mean, dear Lord, everything. <laughs> you know, I, I'm an avid cook. I'm a jazz person, so I listen to a lot of jazz albums and a lot of new stuff that I hadn't heard in a long time. Um, and you know, I've been writing a lot because I'm a writer and dabble in that, and um, you know, trying to just keep myself sane. I think it healthy is an important part of it, and ritual, habit, comfort. Drinking a bit, which is, I think everyone's been doing, you know, <laughs> and I, and I don't exactly love that. That's how that is. Um, how's my audio? Would it be better if I put the AirPods in? I uh, thought, I, I think it's great, but you could try it. Let's just leave it like yeah. that then. Cause then it doesn't look like I have little white things in my ears. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, it sounds, it sounds fine. Great. Yeah, you're good on in that front. So, uh, um, dude, thanks for coming on our main demographic. I'm sure you've, you've seen every episode. <laughs> I've seen zero episodes. <laughs> all right, all right. Our main demographic is up and coming actors, filmmakers, people in the industry looking for knowledge. So we know you've done some big movies. We kind of want to start by taking it back. Like, how'd you get into acting originally? Um, okay, so that's, you know, I think every single actor has a complicated answer that's almost, it's more, uh, you're going to get a, a slice of someone's life that you're going to get any like insight into your own because I think every single person who decides to become an actor. This is for a variety of reasons. Um, I was in college, I was on my way to being a doctor. I was pre-med, I was studying sciences and all kinds of stuff like that. And I had a class freshman year on kind of a, a budding interest in acting. So I took an acting class and it just so happened the school I went to had an absolutely first rate theater department. So the teacher I had was a really good, especially for introductory acting teacher. And you know, in a scene I was doing, I heard my voice come out of my body, which I think is not uncommon for actors when the first time that happens, like your feelings are in your voice. We all know they're in your body more than they're in your mind. And I just heard something about my entire life in that moment. Like I just felt like I'd expressed myself in some particular way. And I, I it's to this day, it's as clear as anything ever, right? Like I remember where I was when it happened, the movement of my body and all that. And um, I think that was the beginning. Now there's many other, you know, 
antecedent steps that came before and there's many things that happened after you know that that was a precedent though for me to follow and this was university of california san diego that's right yeah all right cool i did my homework um <laughs> And then, and, and, and way to congratulate yourself for doing so. Well, I, <laughs> nobody else will here. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> one, of some, one of some brownie points. <laughs> um, so, did you immediately sign on and take more classes? Change the major? No, I didn't. Well, I, that those are both uh, both yes, but not necessarily related. So, so I took a lot more classes. Um, I was very interested in the teachers they had there. The graduate school, as I said, was really, really good for acting. Very, very good for directing. It was very avant garde in some ways in the arts, but it had a very technically strong theater program and we got those teachers. So, you know, I studied with people like Andre Belgrader and Walt Jones and I learned so much from Luther James, the late Luther James, one of the great acting teachers I ever had. And um, I started to get the real deal and I started to learn that there was a craft to it. And I was really kind of crap at it, to be honest. Like, I think I, I had a lot of like natural sort of access to certain things and I technically was really unsound and didn't understand how it worked. But I mean, that's not uncommon for most people in college because you're still discovering who you are and it's a complicated art as we all know. Um, but then, you know, I, I changed my major to politics so I wasn't gonna be a doctor anymore. And I knew by about sophomore, junior year, you know, that I wanted it. I was very seriously considering becoming a professional actor. And then I went to drama school where I really learned how to do it, do it. Um, and I worked with some incredible people, incredible teachers, a great classmates. I mean, you know, half of a good drama school program is how good your classmates are. And I had first rate classmates for the most part. Um, and, you know, I learned a lot there and it became much more of a craft there. It became, the, you know, you get into it. I think everyone gets into it in one way and then you are in it and that becomes kind of the same way, right? Which is that everyone's pursuing a craft to understand the parts of themselves and their work that they don't do well, that they don't have access to, is a better way to put it. And drama school is the beginning of having a lot of keys in your pocket and a toolkit and trying to open all these doors, both technically and personally. Is there a certain um, technique that you liked best, like Meisner or Stanislavski? Well, or I think, you know, look, this is all very complicated, but let's get into it. So <laughs> acting, I think, I think act, let me just get comfortable. Acting is a kind of indescribable personal intimacy that you relate through storytelling, you know? And all these techniques try to get you to like prod and pull the different muscles of that anatomy apart and look at it, right? Miser was so important to me because I don't think I understood the difference at all then, and maybe not even until I was well in school after I'd had quite a bit of Meisner and some, and some uh, Stanislavski, but Suzuki as well. Um, the Meisner is maybe the only technique you learn that teaches you how to do the doing of acting, right? The most important thing you learn as you're coming up is that acting is really, really about preparation. And it is. A lot of what makes good acting good acting is prep, research, passion, conviction, and a kind of private work product that becomes the basis of your work, I think, you know, at least for my technique. Um, but Meisner to me was the first thing where I understood what the hell was happening when you were really doing it, right? And how to train a muscle that you don't actively use, but is the most actively happening thing when you're acting, right? You're not doing a Meisner exercise, but the Meisner exercise is a genius in terms of it making that tympanum and you really resonant with what happens and the impulse and what, how to respond. So I think that's crucially kind of how you're going to learn different processes you know like you can learn that any old way you can learn it in a troop just imitating someone and learning on your way up and you can learn it in an acting class by just taking notes from a good teacher and that gets trained into another way some of these things are just really direct good ways of training so miser meant a lot to me suzuki probably meant as much or more because i was a very what is that so the suzuki technique by tadashi suzuki it's a stomping physical acting training system came out of japan Okay. And we had it in our second year uh, in drama school. My teacher was Jeffrey Burr. And, you know, I was a really good actor from the head up, like from the neck up. Uh, I didn't really know anything was going on below the neck when I first got there. And uh, voice class, Alexander was huge. But Suzuki was what dropped my center, you know. And um, there's a lot of youth where you're acting. People don't know it, but they're acting from my ear up. They're doing a lot of hands and they're 
you know, and they're very good sometimes too. You can see it in a lot of what we watch, but it has no depth or no, none of that danger because their body isn't involved, you know, and your body, I think is the most important resource. As my teacher said in drama school, acting is principally a physical enterprise, right? And uh, Suzuki was about your body becoming a huge part of the strength of your work and the rigor of that, you know? So that, that's, I think those are the basic techniques. Everybody has to take speech. I think if you want to be any good at all, everybody has to have voice. You have to have that, especially if you don't get a theater, but I think you're going to act at all because your emotions are caught up in your breathing and your feeling and your access to yourself and how you experience your feelings and how you can intimately prepare yourself for the work that's required. I think it has a lot to do with how your body works and its breathing mechanisms and how your tension is held and all that. So, you know, I think all those things added up to teaching me. So they're like the meat and potatoes. There were all the meat and the potatoes of everything. But yeah, if I was to say one thing, maybe my moment might've been the most important thing. When you, uh, when you decided to, uh, not become a doctor essentially and pursue acting. What did your family think? <laughs> well, I mean, this is a question I get all the time, and some of it's because I'm Indian, but some of it's also because uh, being doctor to actor is a huge change. Uh, although, it, you know, in spelling, not so much. Um, I think my parents are really shocked, and they were not very happy. And it's been a lifetime of their loving me through their disappointment, you know, and a lifetime <laughs> of me. Uh, living under the yoke of that disappointment and try not to take it too personally, although it's very hard with your parents, um, but really not because, you know, that's about cultural expectation and who we all think we are and who we all want our kids to be and who we want our parents to be, right? It, it ends up being like where if you really study yourself and you study your relationships and try to be better in them, you'll realize that we're all operating under like some pretty heavy delusions about who we think the people who are, we love are. And my parents obviously thought I was going to be this kid who grew up to be a doctor and brought a lot of pride in the Indian model to their family. And I thought my parents were going to be these, like, they were already so progressive in some ways that I thought they were going to be able to just be like the parents of my erstwhile compatriots who came to see every play they ever did, whether it was like the nursery school play or whatever. Right. And to my parents, that was like a very little value till way later till I think they changed their minds and knew, a, I was serious, right? I was going to do it with my life. And B, that like it meant something to me. And I communicated that to them. And, you know, I think they started to kind of change their way of looking at it. And they've done a lot in the last many years now. They've come a lot more. They see a lot more of my work. They've come to my premieres a couple times. Um, they've been hugely important in helping me find my own identity as I've gone through the process of becoming an artist which is a huge part of, I think, the frontier of being a more professional artist is you, you end up being um, an archaeologist of yourself, you know, and these things and how you feel about your parents and how deep those relationships are and how far they go back and how they affect you um, and how many different calluses you've put up that don't let you feel certain things you need to work on so you can feel them in your work and in yourself, you know. Um, those things, they've been very, very helpful in that, and I'm – very proud of my relationship with them now. Not proud, not proud of like I want other people to know it. I'm glad we have what we have. You know, it makes yeah. me feel much happier that this is where we've ended up. Was there was there one project where they you felt like where they finally kind of came around where they were like, okay, now we believe no, he's a serious actor. It's not a script. No. It's like a, <laughs> I guarantee you, most of it happened in in their house by themselves and together talking about it on their own, like in incremental yeah. stages of them examining how they were feeling about it. And these other moments came up like little islands in the sea where they could go and, and show their change or feel their change, right? And, um, you know, there are moments you can tell stories about that are great stories, but I don't want to over dramatize them as like, you know, they saw me and they, they really wanted, <laughs> but you know, like the first movie I ever had a premiere for uh, was a movie called Drag Me to Hell that I made with Sam Raimi. Saw it in theaters. Um, yeah, I love that one. Yeah. It's a movie. great movie. I mean, yeah. he's a great, great director. Um, great cast, just the best crew. What a great, great time. Um, but that was the second movie I'd made, but the first one that came out. And my father had never been to the movies in like 38 years at that point. He'd never gone wow. to a movie theater. Um, and so I brought them as my date to Grauman's Chinese Theater. And Universal, who was the distributor, had kind of their PR department, had kind of, someone there had found out that my, my parents had never been to the movies and 
you know, they, it was also well known that my parents weren't particularly stoked on like career choice at that point. Um, so like we got out on the red carpet at the Chinese and like, you know, all these cameras were on them and they're like, whoa, all right. But, I mean, they, didn't, they didn't like, you know, quail or, or flinch from it. They were just like, okay. Um, and they were very, you know, blown away by the scale of the, you know, the, uh, the machinery that makes it special, right? Because that stuff is all kind of an art of its own, right? Presentation, scarcity, um, the glamour, you know, glamour and glamour. And the kind of joy of that whole thing is a, is a made thing, you know, and they were like, wow, it's pretty cool. And I, I do remember, you know, these are vegetarian people who've never eaten any flesh in their lives. And the <laughs> after party was at Katsuya. So like there was nothing for them to eat, basically like edamame, <laughs> you know, and my mom's like, no, it's all right. Don't worry about it. My dad's like, um, I want to get a glass of wine, uh, which is not that common for him when he's out. But I, he, I was like, yeah, he's like, do I pay? I was like, dad, everything's free. Don't worry about it. And so I went to the bar to get him a glass of wine and I came back and he was talking to Sam Raimi and I was like, <laughs> Oh my God, like what is he saying? Right. Um, and I walked up and I will say, this is like the, the, the thing that felt great. It was also, I think Sam doing me a solid cause he knew the, my, how my dad felt, you know? And so I was walking up and neither of them saw me. And then uh, Sam was, I heard Sam say, you know, I really think your son is very, very talented and I really like working with him. He's great. And then I hear my dad go, well, thank you for giving our son a chance. <laughs> it, was, it was like one of those moments where you're like, perfect. At least he didn't say, Sam, hey, the movie wasn't very good. I don't know what you were doing. You know, at least well, he didn't say I something like that. Well, I think bad, he might have been like, you know, uh, very, very different, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know how much of a critic he really is, but if it doesn't resonate with him, it doesn't resonate with him, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that was even a particular type of movie, like people who uh, aren't into either Sam Raimi um, or just like horror movies might have been a little surprised, but that was, you know, a well put together movie. Yeah, well, I think that part of that is the Sam is a very technically silent filmmaker, which is not always true of all filmmakers, by the way, but I think it's true of the ones I've worked with. They're all technically so competent that the writing is so clearly part of who they are as directors that that makes a big difference and it, and it makes it so that they're able to complete the picture as they intended in some way like uh, the thing i think we all learn about filmmaking when you start making movies is that they're even more so than plays they're kind of made with different intentions as they go along they're written one way especially you know most of the time the screenwriter is not the director so the screenwriter writes a story that is either reinvention or adaptation. And it's always some amalgamation of themselves and some material they're working on. And then that goes into the hands of production. And then there's a whole incredible technical mechanical carnival that's trying to create every piece of that thing. And then, you know, it, it, the more you make movies, you realize you're making pieces. It's like, you know, it, I always say like making Avatar was like making, um, you know, that, that pointillist painting. Uh, a Sunday on the, uh, the Grand Jat by Surat. It's like every one of those dots was a piece of genius that Jim and the crew and the cast made. And so we kind of assemble it, right? And then they go and assemble it and they make it again. So I think when someone makes a movie with that kind of competency and talent, it does always seem to resonate at some level. And I think Sam's just very, very talented. Yeah, I agree. And, and I, before we get into your experience working on those big movies, like how many years were you like pounding the pavement? Because it seems like Drag Me to Hell was such a big movie to get, especially early on. Well, I got Avatar first. So oh, I will say okay. this is like, you know, one of those Hollywood stories, but it is the truth is that I came out here from drama school. I had the first offers of an agent to sign me and a manager in New York. I didn't feel super strong about living in New York City at the time, although sometimes I wish I had because it would be fun. But um, I didn't feel very strongly about my connection to it. It felt a little alien to me. I still wasn't ready to deal with the city like that. I'm sure if I'd moved there in six months, I'd have been fine. But I just didn't feel awesome about it. And I'm from LA, so LA feels a lot more comfortable to me. So I moved to LA and I had no agent, no manager, nothing. And I was here just being an ass, you know, like, doing all the wrong things, sending your picture to all the wrong people, you know, doing backstage West stuff. I had done the showcase, so I did have some contacts here and there. I did get called in for the occasional co-star audition, which I never nailed. And then I would get a couple plays here and there because I'd been seen. And I also was working in the theater pretty soon after I graduated. So 
I was working in regional theater. So I was working. I just wasn't working in front of a camera. And so then I, you know, like this again, everyone has a different story of how you get your first agent. Uh, my agent was an assistant at a big company and she was a friend of a friend who was in a theater company that we formed theater company. We had like one production, maybe two. Um, but mostly what we were was we were a scene reading company where we got together and worked out some scenes, either read them cold or, or prepared them and acted them. And then we critiqued each other. Right. Which is so, something, it's something to be doing and you're keeping your chops up. Right. And everyone in that group was pretty good actually, which was kind of awesome. No one sucked. They were all very different types and processes, but no one was terrible and everyone was pretty good and everyone had a pretty decent eye. And um, we also cared about each other. So she was a friend of my friend who was in that company. She said, I'm going to represent you. So she represented me under the table for a little bit under a year. And then she got promoted to an agent at another company. She became a full-fledged agent. She is my agent to this day. I was her first client. She was my first agent. And it's Whoa. been that way. I didn't work in front of a camera for almost seven years. I tested four times for TV shows. I didn't get any of them. I never booked a job in front of a camera and she stuck with me the whole time. Did and you find you had to like recalibrate like as you were learning how to act in front of the camera? Did you have to recalibrate anything or? No, I don't think, I don't think that's right. I don't think it's calibration because I don't think it's like measurement. Calibration has in it like a measure. You mm -hmm. can't measure that. It's a comfort thing and it's about getting, I mean, I think the generations that are coming up now are so much luckier because they have access to cameras and they work with them all the time. They've been on camera since they were children, right? So they're a lot less nervous about that eye, whereas I grew up in a generation where the movies were like, you know, a big deal and it's a real vulnerable position. And I don't think I was ready to transfer the intimacy of the stage to this object, to treat it like a friend. And, you know, the tumblers are always tumbling, right? There's always some variance in your performance. Something is always going on because you're alive. And then I just booked Avatar, like out of nothing. And um, suddenly I was off to New Zealand and I'm shooting a movie that doesn't even have a name yet. And Jim's been working on it for years. I meet him. I like him immediately, but I'm also like, uh, I think you're going to fire me. And he's like, why? I'm like, because I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> oh and he's like, God. he's like, no, I think you do know what you're doing. And he's like, and also I'm the operator, so I'll be right here. I'm watching it. And, you know, that might have been... That's such a bold well, thing to say to the to James Cameron. I think you're going to fire me, you know. Well, I think it was just my, my being... I couldn't handle the level of anxiety I was feeling in terms of being out of my depth, I thought, right? Because I'd never made anything in front of a camera before, right? Um, and then what I realized, I think what happened was that he is so smart and so deeply comprehending everything that's happening that once you just trust him then I was just acting and that part I was I knew I could do because I was a I'm a good actor I know what I'm doing at that point in my life and what ended up really helping me was giving him all of my worry I let him worry about the shots and then I just did what I thought was interesting right and I created this character I did all my work I did all the homework I done everything I would do if I was doing Chekhov, right? More, because this was also not known. It was like more like a new play. And, you know, that movie taught me so much about film acting. It taught me so much about what it was, not just to do your work on a day with a group, like how you, how you do your job, but it taught me how the camera sees what you're doing. And we shot so much, you know, we shot so much on that movie comparatively like the later movies I was like my first movie it was so different than anything else I would ever make right um but we shot so much it was almost like I'd shot two or three movies and I learned so much so fast it was like I'd made up and I also had it concentrated in a very high quality project that allowed me to have a really good avenue with my own character to do what it is I had to do so I I think you know the shock of the new was like going like into a thousand miles in five seconds to some degree, but you also took your time in another way. I've always said like, you know, acting as I made those movies in a row, right? Uh, acting career feels a lot like this metaphor to me. 
And that is, and this will maybe if this your audience, people are up and coming. This is important to hear because this is exactly where I am now, where I was then, where you are right now. And that is that it is like you're in a really fancy hotel and everyone is in the lobby, right? And you're at the bar, you're in the seats, you're hanging out. All of you and your cohort and compatriots and literally teaming hundreds of thousands are in the lobby, right? And everyone wants to get on the elevator to go to the penthouse. Everyone just wants to get on that elevator, right? Book your first job, get in a movie, get on TV, get a career, you know? And then one day someone says, hey, come here, you're getting on the elevator. And like your friends are all, oh my God, it's happening. And you run and you go and you meet them, you all get in the elevator, you're on the elevator. The elevator's going 100 miles an hour. Everyone on there is amazing. They're all these awesome people and you love it for the most part. It's also so exciting. You get to the top, ding, everyone shakes each other's hands, you walk out and you're back in the lobby. And that <laughs> is what it always, always, always is. You are always going to be back with yourself, your process, your technique, your career. And it is not about the penthouse. It isn't even about the ride. It's about you understanding that that's how it will always be and to enjoy it all, you know? So yeah, I, I think booking Avatar obviously changed my life. It changed how I understood what I did. I learned a tremendous amount there. When I went to work out, I shot Drag Me to Hell inside Avatar. Like, we were still contracted to do the post. I was still doing a post on, on Avatar while I was doing Drag Me to Hell. And I just remember walking into that set feeling a lot more confident, I think, than if that had been my first movie. I thought you were going to say, uh, you take the stairs. That's what I thought you were going to say. That's what I thought. Instead of, instead of the elevator. No, I, I, uh, I, I'm not into those self-punishing philosophies either, by the way. <laughs> I mean, if you need to get your ass kicked and run up the stairs, okay, get yeah. your ass kicked and run up yeah. the stairs. But I don't think you're better for it. Yeah. I think whatever brings you into better communion with yourself and closer to the intimacy of your own vulnerability, like they tell you that when you're younger, you don't believe them or you don't understand it. But the older you get and life starts passing and you start doing work and you do great work, you do good work, you do bad work, you see good work, you see great work, you see bad work, you work with playwrights, you work with filmmakers, writers, you just see the total depth of love and talent that's been poured into you and all of the experiences you've had that have moved through you and you realize they're right. Your job is to tell the truth about what you experienced, whether it's painful whether it's vulnerability, whether it's love, whether it's intimacy, that becomes the process. So yeah, like all those things about working hard, I assume, I assume anyone that wants to be an actor has their ass on fire enough to work hard. That's not, I, I don't, if, I, if that's what you need to be told, then I don't know what the hell you're doing, right? Like find something you are willing to work hard at. This requires a tremendous amount of effort, you know? And it, uh, I think the older you get, the more it's about how you relate to yourself. Yeah. And talk, talking about Avatar, just because uh, James Cameron is one of my favorite directors too. Terminator 2 is one of my all-time favorite movies. Um, is there anything like specifically you feel like you learned from him being on set with somebody that's so intelligent, um, just knows his ways around cameras and he's, I mean, you, you know, there's a specific I, story maybe about him, you know? Well... You know, I will tell you this, and I'll tell it to you this way, is that, you know, when, once in a while he'll clear the set out completely and just use his hands and walk around with the frame and see everything. And you, if you are behind him and you look through this part, you're starting to see what he's seeing and you're seeing what's forming in his brain. What I think he taught me, this may be, a, you know, something that we all have to modulate for ourselves, but what he taught me was the filmmaker... Is, going, is, is your ally and is the person who's in whose mind the most fecund part of the movie is happening. So you have to connect with them on a level where you trust each other. And Jim is not a person I think who gives this trust easily, but he is generous. He's ready to trust you if you're ready to be there, you know, and if you can trust him. And the number one thing I'll say working on working with Jim whether it was on Avatar or now the sequels, which were, you know, on pause for. Um, I think he and I trust each other. You know, I think he trusts me to do what I, whatever the scope of my part is, whatever the scope of the scene is, I think he trusts me and I trust him immensely. And I, I think his talents are so enormous that you start to understand the visual nature of what you're doing. You know, there's a, 
a lot of film acting, no matter if you're doing The Godfather or you're doing Panic in Needle Park or The Abyss or, you know, a giant Chris Nolan movie or a giant Jim Cameron movie. There's some of it that ha what we do as actors is we lend a naturalism to things. We lend a reality to things, a truth to things, especially if they're science fiction-y or even if they're like, you know, I'm in the world of drug deal, right, or something, then you have to be the person who can give that physical, pure truth to the thing because you know it so well. And that requires a commitment and a homework and a physical ease and a, a mental obviation of its weirdness that you have to generate. The filmmaker can't generate that. They can only generate the shot that shows it. You know, and um, you have to trust each other that way. By the time you uh, auditioned for Inception, did yeah. Chris, did Christopher Nolan um, was he did you, it was just like a cold uh, go in submitted through the agent, or did Christopher Nolan pick you because he saw you in those movies? You know, to be honest, sometimes you don't know the answer to that, and I still don't actually know. He didn't see me in those movies because nothing had come out yet, right? Oh. It was so bang, bang, bang. It happened so fast, and Avatar's post was so long right we finished shooting in january of let me get this right yeah in january of 08 february maybe right around there we didn't come out till december 2009 damn right the post was longer than sometimes whole movies take twice so the enormity of i think i have those dates right yes because then i shot drag me to hell in may of 08 that came out in May of 09, right? So, and I was auditioning for Inception as the premieres were starting to come up for, for uh, um, Drag Me to Hell. I, we went to Cannes with the movie. I asked my agent, I said, look, I think there's a new Chris Nolan movie. And I had vowed, you know, in 05 when I was an actor who just, I've been doing a, 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 a pretty good amount of regional theater. But again, I'd never shot a frame. I went to a Batman Begins. And my little sister was living in New York City, uh, you know, between college and, and graduate school. And I was staying with her for a week. And in her building was a movie theater. And I went there and see Batman Begins. And I was so blown away. I was like, made a personal vow to myself. I'm going to work with that guy one day. And I had no idea who that guy was going to become. I knew Memento. I knew that movie. I liked um, uh, Insomnia pretty well. But I didn't know him that, like, that way, you know? I told my agents, I'm like, he has a new movie he's doing after The Dark Knight, which, like, you know, that was, that movie had blown the lid off. So we'd seen yeah. the trailer on the set of Avatar, and we're like, holy shit, like, that's <laughs> insane, right? So that movie had already come and gone. I was trying to get in, and then my agent was like, look, they're not taking any income and calls on this project. They just told us that. So, you know. But it also turned out that the casting director for Drag Me to Hell, Sam Raimi's casting director, John Papsadera, was Chris Nolan's casting director, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So then I flew to New York, basically like they're only getting a movie stars. That's what he always casts, right? He casts movie stars and up and coming super talent like Tom Hardy, right? Not that I knew who Tom Hardy was at the time, but like that's who he casts. He gets the best of the best. So like, yeah, you know, whatever. I'm not anything yet. And even when this movie comes out, I'm not the lead banana. So whatever, like that's not gonna happen. And when I landed in New York, I have like four messages on my phone. And they're all from my agent. I'm like, what's going on? They're like, you have got to call us right now. And I'm like, hello, what's going on? They're like, There's, we just got a call from John Papsadera. There is a part in this movie for you. This new movie called Inception. I, thought, I don't even know they had the name yet. Maybe they did. I don't know. And I was like, okay, when is the audition? They're like, we need to book it as soon as possible. I'm like, okay, I'm going back to the airport right now. I'll just buy my ticket and fly back right now. So I literally like went to my friend's apartment <laughs> I called the airline. I couldn't get on that night. I could go the next morning. So I stayed over, flew the next day. I got home, and the day after was the audition. Do you and have I this? I got on the sides yeah. on, the, on, the plane, on the right before I got on the plane. I had just been sitting there for six hours just memorizing these scenes. And then I went in and read for John uh, once. Then I went and read for Chris. And they cut everyone from America except me. And then I read, I tested against everyone with Chris again. I remember the first time I read for Chris, I read both scenes and he's like, I don't know where that awful second scene came from, but it's good, good trouble. And I was like, oh, all right. 
apparently they had like a you know it, it was a bad season with the scene. The first scene was real; it was in the movie. But um, then I went to Cannes. I came back. My agents called me to find out how that was, and they're like, "You just booked this job. Whoa. You start. You start next week, and you got to go see Chris Nolan next week." And that's what I read the script wow. for the first time. I did you feel him. excited? Like this is like you've already done so much cool stuff. This is just like who, I who felt on the cake. Like, you know, I'm a. <laughs> I'm the wrong person to ever be a movie star because I'm the kind of person that gets so anxious at certain moments where I get sort of like, don't get too attached to this. You know, right. like, I'm not like, fuck yeah, dude. See, that's, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, a, there's a part of me that wishes I was like that. And I'm sure I behave that way at certain times where I like tried it on, you know, like a, like a bad shirt. Um, but I'm not, I, I just don't think I'm the kind of person who's like built for um, the, the immaculate grandiosity of it's, of course it happened to me, you know? That's who I am. I was more like, dude, I just hit like the roulette number three times in a row. Like, what in the hell is going on, right? And I, I, I also felt like I was really, really right for the part. Now maybe Jim was like, you know, hire him. Maybe Chris called Jim and said, what do you think? And Jim said, hire him, maybe, maybe, I don't know. Or maybe Chris is like, you know, he's good enough for Jim. I'll, I'll take him, sure. Um, but I tested these all these people who were much older than me. I went down and met him. I read the script that I talked to him. He's like, what do you think the story is? I told him what the story was. He's like, yes, you understand it. He gave me some pointers of what he wanted. And um, then I didn't see them for a month. And I showed up in London and we started working. And uh, the rest is what it is. Dude, how was that cast on set? Like, how was... Yeah, it's... Uh, it's awesome. They're a great impressive people. Cast. Like, what? Impressive cast. There's just, like, a lot of, you know... That's like being on the 27 Yankees. Yeah. Right? It's <laughs> yeah. like that. It's like every member of the crew, the costumes that are just Jeffrey Curland. I mean, you know, Hans Zimmer, uh, Wally Fister is shooting you all freaking day. Chris yeah. Nolan is directing you, you know? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Leo DiCaprio, Tom <laughs> Hardy, Marianne yeah. Cotillard. Oh, don't mention Ken Watanabe, Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Right. Right? <laughs> like, it's just, I'm like, what am I doing here, right? It's like playing shortstop on the 27 Yankees. Like, where it's, like, there's Gehrig, there's Ruth, but it's also your job to play shortstop, right? And by the time you finish shooting it, it's like, hey, I batted 301 and got two homers and we won the World Series, right? Like, like we did pretty good on that movie. And, you know, there are moments where it comes to you. There was a lot of work on that movie. It was a very technically difficult film to shoot sometimes. But Chris makes it all so freaking easy. And, you know, Emma is such an amazing producer. They work everyone pretty hard. But I'll tell you, like, there's nothing like in the world, like when you're in a group like that at those chairs and you're all jumping up, you know, to do the scenes together and then they're shooting parts, parts of it. And, like, you're going up there to do your part and you're on set, all of you sitting in this scene and the cameras are swinging around to you. And every other person has just fucking hit the shit out of it, right? And it's sort of like, you're up, kid. Like, now you got to do it. And you rise, you know? You just rise. They're also so generous. Like, DiCaprio was so generous to me as an actor. He made me a better actor. He made my performance better. He's the best actor I've ever worked with in any medium. Any what, do you mean, what do you mean by generous? Like, I mean, I think like, I know what you mean, but... Well, I, yeah, I think actually it's worth talking about because everyone uses that word and it can mean a million things. But to me personally, like he would get his face smashed into the camera, that movie star face, so that my eye line would travel closer to the iris without being afraid of it, right? Mm -hmm. You get so afraid of looking in the camera when you're inexperienced. And even though I had two movies, I still sometimes was like, am I looking too close to the edge of the map? Like, where am I looking? Like, right now, if I, if I looked right into it, is that, or is that, like, you know, those tiny gradations... So he would just start drifting into the camera to mash my face in, and then I would understand if I just saw his eyeball through, like, ah. you know, as if I had an invisible laser uh, penetration of his eye. Or if, mm -hmm. I had, if I had a dematerialized way to look through the camera into his eyeball, I would have the right eye line, right? So I was delivering the performance to the edge of the camera's map box, and then I knew that, but he was moving me even closer to, like, the edge of the lens and, like, past the edge of the lens towards the iris, you know? And I'm like, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And then I saw it, like, 30% or more of my face is is on the take you know and so in that way he was generous he would also he would give so much in the off camera uh performance so that you have something that immediately touched you because he's so good that it like it just affects you it, like just feels so real 
Um, and he's just like, you know, inclusive. Like there's a really important part to movie acting. I think that is that it can sometimes get fucked up and it hasn't been my experience that it does, but sometimes it can be, which is that like most other departments feel like teams, right? The camera department, the hair makeup department, wardrobe, uh, transpo, uh, catering, uh, you know, AD production. Like sometimes the acting team doesn't seem like a team. It feels like a bunch of atoms just showing up and doing their thing. When DiCaprio was the lead of that movie, it was like we were a unit. And he kept us all feeling included and was personally really friendly and good and a good guy, like a really nice man. But you know, also like, how, do you, how would you figure out this part? And I'm like, I would do it this way. And then I could ask him, I'm like, what is this thing here? And he'd be like, I would think this. And I'm like, oh yeah, okay. And like, you know, there's just... I don't know how much experience you guys have making movies, but like sometimes when these big movies have scenes that are like really complicated, you all have to be so accommodating with each other's styles, techniques, and what each person has to do. It's almost like you're like steering the car and then they're going to take the wheel and you take your hand off. And like, it's like you have to be in that kind of concert with each other, right? Sometimes because it's so technical. Like when I was driving the van around and they're all back there, right? And yeah, the shots yeah. are of them, but they're not talking that much. Like, I'm doing some talking. I'm looking around and driving. And there's like, you know, a hundred million dollars of movie star behind me. And I'm like, <laughs> don't crash. Don't crash the van. You know? yeah. um, but like, you know, that was a lot of like really cool. Like once you're in, everyone's in. It's like being a camp or something. Everyone's yeah. kind of doing the best they can. And it's awesome when it's that talented. You know, it's like amazing. What's what that? Go ahead. I was just going to say, what's your take on the ending of Inception? It was a little ambiguous with that spinning top. Well, I think if you listen to the ending, the ending is clear. Okay, that it that he was in, that he was in uh, his I forgot what it's called Inception. Uh, no, I think if you listen to the end, you'll hear it wobble. Ah, that it, that it falls over. Okay, it's going to fall over. It just cuts out before it does. Okay, I'm just making sure. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I just don't think Chris is the sort of person that would ever do something to mislead you. If he does, the payoff is bigger. Right, the truth is bigger when you go back. It'll look like it for sure. Gotcha. It won't look like, see, I fucked you over because he's not like that. I think his own intellect would be insulted by that. That's why I don't think he would do it. Um, but I think that he's also willing to go. What if I just clip the very end? Right, right, the inevitable thing. Then you should be able to still tell what happens. I think that's kind of how he might work because to him it's really interesting to be like, isn't it interesting that we know so much on the way? And yet so many of us need that final bit to believe our own ears, right? I think that's what becomes interesting to him. I don't know for a fact, because, you know, when you make a movie with someone like that, you're not going to go, so what do you think the end is? <laughs> <laughs> I think, does, it, does it fall or does it not? Well, so we we kind of know, right? And you also feel like if I interrogate the, him on this, I'm not taking him at his word as an artist. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's, that's the thing that's really difficult when people want it. Like, talk shows are terrible about this. Fans are bad about this sometimes where, like, they really want to ask people. I mean, I don't care. I'll answer whatever you want. But when they ask the artist, what does your art mean? Like Kubrick or someone. It's like you're not taking the artist at their word. It's like you don't want to go to the theater. You don't want to have that experience. Because the number one thing I think you understand in life, look, feel it now, feel it as an adult, feel it in your work, is people don't like to be uncomfortable. Right? They don't like to be asked, well, what do you think? Right? And if they do, they have a really over strenuous opinion. They're never like, well, actually, I'm not sure. I think yeah. this, but I don't know, you know, because we're all taught that we're going to be attacked if we're vulnerable. But like, like I was said when I said, Jim, like, I think you're going to fire me. I think sometimes great things come out of just saying the truth, you know? So. I was just uh, kind of curious and obviously working with Nolan, was he more, obviously he's very technically minded, but working with the actors, was he very hands-on or what was his approach with you guys? You know, I think he's not super hands-on. He is a little bit. He expects you to kind of know what the hell you're doing. He, to him, it's like, I feel like um, it's like he's, He's like a, a, a nucleus, right? That's drawing the rest of the particles along. He's like the center part of the nucleus of the atom. And it 
pulls the other protons and neutrons as the center moves, the whole magnetic moment of the object is moving. So he's inducing us forward. He doesn't, I mean, he'll definitely jump in and go do this, trans that, blah, 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 like that. But he's not, ma he's not manhandling us. He's not trying to create the film through our performances. He is letting us perform and let, letting that become the movie, right? Which is a huge part of when you hire really good actors. And I'm not saying me, but definitely the rest of that cast. Um, when you hire really excellent actors, let them do their work. Their taste is as much as anything what you've hired them for. And you're going to get a much better movie when you do that. And the art of directing actors is finding a way for them to believe that what you're saying is their um, believable, committed idea. And the most easy way to do that is to make them believe it's their idea, right? But the second best way to do that is to believe, for them to trust the director so much so like, that's got to be the idea, right? And so I think he just, he's a person who kind of draws you along. He like pulls you towards the idea without pushing you around too much. What is uh, what's your view, generally speaking, about the representation of minorities or specifically uh, Indian American actors in Hollywood? Because I've heard other actors like Riz Ahmed come out and say there's a problem here. Well, I think for me, Riz is awesome. We were at Sundance at the Institute together once shooting a different project. Um, he's a wonderful, wonderful actor, very talented, very talented rapper, too. I think that, you know, I was the generation that came right at the beginning of our trying to get work and be professional. There were other Indian actors for years, decades even, but they weren't necessarily professional in that they earned their living or sought to make their living as actors or even allowed to. You know, A huge part of it was we weren't allowed to be in things. We just weren't. And there had to be like an affirmative action to even get us a play. There have to be a play about India to you for you to get a part so who the hell is going to work right no one is going to train for one job a decade right and so we had done that and we were suffering by the bylines you know the inertial racism of our nation and the world whether it's out of colonialism slavery segregation jim crow there's an inertial racism we've all inherited it's in all of us it's in every single one of us and it's the, as James Baldwin called it, the invention of whiteness, you know? And whiteness is the currency of our medium. It always has been, it still is. We've had a few years now where more people of darker skin and more women and more um, varied genders and people who've lived, who lived in society forever, you know? People who've been part of human society forever are suddenly representing human society, right? And so, the issue I would take, like, I have been so fortunate, right? I work with three of the greatest filmmakers of my living lifetime. And Jim and Chris and Sam, Mike goes down as some of the greatest filmmakers that have ever lived, right? So, certainly in the top 250, right? Um, it's a medium that's only 100 years old and it's been white for 99 of it. Like, I think it's 110 years old. 90 some odd years of it is 100% white, right? And then the number of roles is probably, honestly, if you look at the number of roles that have ever been cast in a motion picture that's released by a studio, I bet you the number is 99.9997% white. Everyone is, you know? And the problem is not everyone actively wants to call you a name, right? Or they actively secretly think you're subhuman. It's that they're so afraid of the white group think that they've been inculcated with if you were the lead, right? If you were in a romance with a human being that was not the same race as you, right? That you could represent America, yeah? And so what Riz is talking about is that there's a kind of deference, like we defer to the lowest common denominator of revulsion towards racial diversity as a society without, when, we, when if someone said that at the dining table, we, would e we might even just be quiet there, or we might say, hey, shut the fuck up, don't say that, right? We might say that. But people in power often defer to that lowest common denominator of racial revulsion out of a fear that if those people said, you're, you're revolting me, they would have committed the ultimate sin, rather than saying, me repressing this person because of their, their, color, their skin color or their gender or their, um, you know, uh, 
disability, right? Which I don't even like that word, but you know, that's the standard I guess we go with now. Um, that we're shutting people out of the business, right? And it's really hard to construct a whole new language for it's okay to have this person be the lead. It's okay for that woman to have that job, right? And you end up in these really weird conversations with people, right? Like, where I've had some of my white actor friends be like, dude, I can't get in. It's like, enough with the diversity. I'm like, enough with the diversity? It's been three years. And they still only account for 10% of the jobs, right? So like, enough with the diversity. Even my most liberal white actor friends would be like, enough with that. You're like, really? Okay. Wow. And, and then I said to my friend, I said, I want you to understand that if we stopped casting white people for 100 years, and only had people of color on screen. It's, a, it's only black people, Latinos, some Asians, some Indian Americans, yes, but no white people could ever work. And we did it for a hundred years. It would just come out to even, right? Interesting, yeah. Right? And even if we said, let's, let's make it proportional, right? Well, then it would be like 40 years with no white people ever working, ever, ever. Imagine a world like that, right? That shows you the power and the centrality of what is whiteness to our culture. Now, I don't blame, I blame all of us, but I blame the people in power, right? And I blame the idea that we haven't developed enough. Like, make no mistake, you can be a great actor and never be a movie actor. You can be a wonderful actor and never be a movie star. The creation of a movie star is an amalgamation between an actor's deep intent certain characteristics that may or may not be in vogue and the machinery of star generation that is the studio's entire purpose to some degree, right? right. That we have not invested enough in developing African-American stars and glamorous African-American, you know, it's not that they're not glamorous. It's that the, the machinery of Hollywood that creates the affect has not embraced them or celebrated them. The, physical looks of dark skinned people and all that, that has not been brought to the centrality. Like there's nothing weirder, right? Than when you're shooting a movie and you have a white person go, God, you have such great skin. And you go, <laughs> okay, thank you. But you have no idea like what that skin in this society cost me. Yes, I have no blemishes at that time, especially, right? I have no uh, zits. I don't have any sun damage really, right? Because of bra my brown, it helps me. But I can't, like the first decade of my career, I couldn't read for 99.9% .9 of the job. I couldn't yeah. even read, right? And so my career has clearly shown that I was competent at least. I don't want to say excellent, but at least competent enough to do some of those jobs, right? Couldn't even get a look-see. So it's a very complicated thing. I think we're making some headway. I think we're going through a very difficult time uh, as a country trying to digest so much of this. Um, some people seem allergic to the, I think, pretty uncontroversial idea that racism is part of American history and continues to be part of who we are. I don't think that's a very controversial statement. Some people have an allergy to it. Some people don't want to acknowledge it, right? Because maybe it indicts them or they don't want to see their privilege. It's like, okay, why don't we try just the empathy route then? We got, but whatever it is, there's an inexorable march towards progress, I think, that we're all, because we're all making that march together. Um, I do believe, you know, look, show business doesn't matter as much as moral truth, but what King said about the arc, of, the moral arc bends towards justice, right? It's like, I, I think that's right. I, I think that eventually the arc does bend the right way, but we have to bend it. We are, we are the, uh, the hammer and the anvil and the, and the kiln you know, and we have to be that forge and that power. But, you know, I see younger Indian actors working. I see other parts of the actors that look like me playing parts. I couldn't be happier. There's some part of me that's like, wait, I want that job, right? But <laughs> uh, because I'm an actor and yeah. we're all like that, right? We're all super competitive. Um, but it makes me happy to see people working, look like me. I see a lot more black actors working. Like there's generations of young black actors who are working now where there were actors in my generation who were black who just, unless they could play pimps or like drug dealers, um, and they had that street affect, they were just not allowed to be part of the system. And I mean, just when people really try to take that in, it will make you understand how deeply, deeply bigoted it was, you know? 
is the answer as simple as we need more um, people of color, like in the in the writing jobs, in the distribution companies, like get get the diversity in those things, and then it'll take care of itself. A, I don't know if that's simple because it's very difficult to get people in those jobs. Those jobs are highly sought after. True. Um, B, I think it will have a huge impact. But those people have to feel the freedom and the power to do what they would want to do. And if those people feel the same inertial pressures of racism and, and, and white preference and, and you know, a relegation marginalization of people who are non-white because they've been taught that's how you advance in your job, then it makes no difference. So it's not quite that simple, but it would make a huge difference if those people have the power to do it. I think the younger and younger the executives have become, the more it's happened. I also want to say, like, I think a lot of it has to do with women, and especially women of color, who became executives at these companies and started demanding that the company start to honor what they talk about in their corporate, you know, uh, we are an equal employment opportunity employer. We are HR, you know, neutral. We do not tolerate, just like, they're like, a lot of these women are like, what are we talking about? I see only white actors for these parts. I'm constantly being asked to find a younger, whiter person. And I think people like Bob Iger, people like that started listening to those women. And those women started bringing in people who look like me. And um, I think they're making a huge difference. I think women are a huge, huge part of the future of all this. Whether they're white women or women of color, I think women who understand and give voice to their own uh, oppression, which in our business is not the same. It's a looksism problem. It's a youth problem. It's a pressure to be younger and hotter. And especially when you look at old movies, that even movies you love, you're like, what is Grace Kelly doing making out with this 25 year older man? Right? But that was how that system yeah. just worked. And you're yeah, like, that's how it was, yeah. You're like, this is ridiculous. It's like, it's as stupid as anything, right? You're like, okay, so, that, so I think when women start to tell their truth in that way and they're also having their their power being, I would say restored, but that's not even the right word. It's more like the power is being fractured away from the hegemonic control of men and being given or taken more importantly by women. Minorities such as racial minorities are also gonna benefit from that, from the degree of solidarity and also an empathy for what other people have gone through um, affects us. I, I just think, you know, like, look, you're never gonna get a lot of help from the people who themselves will feel like <laughs> the loss of privilege and hegemony is oppression, right? But you're going to have to make room for that feeling too and be like, hey man, I empathize, it sucks, I'm sorry. Like for my friends who are white actors, for white male actors, they're like, enough with the diversity already, right? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm like, hey man, let me say something. I hear what you're saying. For you, it was always um, the gold paved road. And it was always a, you could be anything. And there were so many examples, like, I mean, I. I'm not going to name, I used to name a particular actor when I said this, but I'm not going to do it anymore because I need some media. But there are a lot of white actors whose mediocrity is so totally to uh, tolerated and allowed to progress. Many of them have multiple, multiple series and they cannot act at all. Like they're barely able to save their lines. They're bored themselves and they make, you know, a couple million dollars a year as an actor, right? They're in the same union as me and Denzel Washington, right? Put a, put a large spectrum on that. Um, <laughs> the day that a black actor or a Latino actor or an actress or, you know, an Indian American actor, the day a guy who looks like me can be that mediocre and make that much money and get offered everything all the time, offer only, yeah, that's when you'll know we've reached some parity or that guy doesn't exist anymore. That's right? when you know you've made it. That's when you know you've made it. Yeah, you you know you've made it when you don't have to do much to get it, right? Yeah. That's not true. I think you know you you know you've made it honestly, and it, you can be as like when you're 21 years old. You know you've made it when you come off that stage, or they say cut, and you feel it going through your physical being with that overused, destroyed word thrill, right? The word thrill used to mean it like physically was running through your flesh, right? And so when that thrill hits you, I think that's when you know you've made it. Damn. I was, uh, I was kind of wondering too, and I don't know if this kind of to piggyback off of what you're talking about, but I noticed that you also produced your own project for the defense. Was that, was mm -hmm. that a, a movie that you guys made, a pilot? Or? It was a pilot we made. Uh, we loved doing it. My buddy Kevin wrote it. And um, yeah, we all threw in some money and we all 
pitched every bit of effort we could, broke our backs and shot it. I still think it was very funny. It was fun. Um, you know, it was so entertaining to do. You learn a lot doing something like that. You know, you learn a lot of why certain things don't happen, why some things do, right? How you get stuff picked up, how you don't. Quality doesn't always beget um, cream rising, right? Cream gets lost a lot in this business. So I enjoyed a lot about learning how to do the producing, how like the day you're the star, you're shooting a lot and you're not doing a lot of the producing. But on the days other people are working, you're doing a lot of the producing. So like you're arranging, gophering, at that level, you're doing it all. But like, you know, you're, you're handling permits, you're handling people, interfaces on the ground, location scouting, locations like, you know, management, you're doing all that stuff and then a million other things, right? And so you end up realizing like how important it is. I think it's important even as an actor, but how important it is to be like, I'm, I'm, I'm gung-ho, I'm 100% in. I'll do whatever it takes. What do you need me to do? Stay three more hours, let's do it, right? Uh, you're not gonna carry the wardrobe around when you're a real set because that's someone's job and they'll yell at you. But when you're shooting your own indie thing, you can, be sh you can be in front of the camera right now in the next shot, you're holding a light. And you better hold the light with the same in, you know, uh, interest and like uh, commitment to excellence as you do in your acting work. Because that is how you build a team. And films are made by teams, plays are made by teams. There is no quote unquote star that just does it. I mean, Orson Welles did that. And you can see how many people are like that on one hand. Was that something that you guys just kind of put together as a, as a way to give opportunity to a lot of, you know, maybe talented friends or actors that you worked with before? That's exactly or, kind of what it was. I mean, we, 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 yeah. we literally took a photo at a wedding, the four of us, and then it looked like an ad for a new law show. And then I came up with the title and Kevin went and wrote it. And then we all read it and we loved it. And so we were like, let's just do it us. And so we just did it. And it was fun. It was great. We won a couple of little tiny TV festival awards with it. And it was, you know, I think it was exactly what it should have been. It had some very funny jokes in it. And uh, it was perhaps, you know, as, as freeing as anything can be because you're in charge, but that freedom can be terrifying because it also means you're the quality control, right? So. Right. Absolutely. Uh, uh, what is your like personal strategy for like, Staying Sorry, you just froze up. Can you start saying that again? Oh, yeah, of course. Uh, uh, what is your personal strategy for staying connected to these people that you work with, like Leo, uh, Jim Cameron? Like, I mean, I know, like, obviously, the goal is to do great work when you're on set, but is there anything else beyond that that, uh, you know, just stay connected with these people? I don't think you could ever do anything but be yourself. And if, you're, and if you make a connection on set that feels like a connection, right? then you're gonna be in touch with that person. And if you don't, you don't. And you can't mistake your intimacy on set for friendship, right? right. Most of those stars are like inundated, right? But I'm still yeah. in touch with some of those people. And I will tell you like, it's your genuine self that seems to speak to anyone, mm -hmm. just like anything else in life. Just like your real friends that you have. If they're gonna become friends of yours, they're gonna become friends of yours, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, I think the thing. And I, I also think like, you can't, you can't put too much on a job. You can't make a job the thing that then becomes your employment train and that you'll always be able to go back and you're going to manage it that way. I just think that's not what the job's for. I think the job is there so that you get to artistically commune with another group of people. Yet, yet, yet a new little circus comes to town and you're in the circus. It's, you're there to do the circus. You're not there to be like, well, what's the next circus going to be? Like, we all know that person. That person's annoying. That person, is, that person is, is they're not annoying because they're worried and their anxiety is present. That's fine. Everyone's a little bit like that. They're annoying because they're not on task. Like, I don't want to talk to an actor that wants to just chat. Like, let's chat a little, sure. Let's have some fun when we're below off team, yes. But the sacred temple level commitment is already ready. Or let's, you know, like, let's go. Like, we're doing it. And now we're going to try to find something in the scene, you know. And that's all of it to me. I, I've never been very good at that. And maybe my career would be better if I was better at it. I know people that are great at it. Um, but I'm pretty happy with where I am. You know, 
I've come to love myself and what I do. Every single actor wishes they were working more, right? Sure. Um, it's just true. It's just no matter who you are. Um, but you never forced a connection that wasn't there and you never, you know, you just came to do the work. And you learn by life that that's just nonsense. you you become just another person forcing something. And if anything you learn in life, don't do that. Right. Don't force anything. Unless you're playing something where a guy is going to force something and learn the lesson. Right. Um, I just, I think that's, there's so much in life that's about, now you don't want to be, you know, reticent. And I've always been the person on my sets in my place where I'm very gregarious. I, I try to be uh, friendly. Um, I'm pretty brainy. And maybe one of my faults is I let that be known pretty quickly. Um, but I, you also got to have empathy for everybody, including yourself. And like everyone's in an environment where they're trying to find their purchase, you know, and their, their place in the floating hierarchy. And um, we all have ways of asserting that, you know, and, I think you're going to get along with people the best if you really try to take your ego out of it and you try to take care of your ego offset and off life, deal with it on your own, you know, therapy, spiritual life, physical life, whatever it is that helps you. That's always going to be your enemy is your ego. There's always a good, healthy sense of self that helps you, but your ego is like a defense thing. It's like a, it's like a really sad little tower that you run into, you know, (laughs) And was that? Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say in our, in our final, you know, five, 10 minutes, you, you sure. were working on, um, I was going to say Avengers avatar. Um, <laughs> and that that's got, the next movie. That's the next yeah, movie. Exactly. Avatar. And that got cut off in the middle due to this pandemic. You said, Oh, I'm not cut off, but I like that word suspended okay. is better. Right. Because okay. cut off makes it sound like something's over. And right. believe me, that ain't over. <laughs> um, yeah, we stopped. Is March something we stopped and, I'd shot a bunch, a bunch. I have pretty small parts of these movies, to be honest with you. But I'm, I think I'm there because Jim wants me in it. And uh, also, I think the character has some, there's a, a, a arc for the character through the movies he's making. So, oh, cool. you know, God bless yeah. him. I'm so grateful for it. I love the this. Doctor character. That was a good character in Avatar. Oh, dude, I loved playing him. And he was so fun to play. And, you know, we came up with the last name because he had a different last name. And I was Indian and I got cast the part. And, it was really great. I, I loved building that character from the inside out. I also thought it was really important that he not be, and Jim gave me some guidance. I was like, he not be like anyone else in the movie. Like that he's not like a badass, that he's not like a, a warrior, that he's not like tough, that he has to maybe become a little tough. And even that freaks him out, right? But that he's brainy and he's like, he's very, he's of the kind of person who's like, who takes pride and, and feels strong and, and his ego is in like, yeah, I'm smarter than you. Like, what are you doing? Right. Um, and I kind of love building that character. But anyway, um, I shot a bunch of stuff that, for that last year uh, towards the fall. And then my part was going to stop for a bit because they were going to shoot a bunch more. I was going to come back because these windows have been moving around. And so now I was supposed to go back right as the shutdown began. And I think because it's in New Zealand, you know, we may, st- John just sort of let us know we might be starting up again. Yeah, because so, they're still they're open over there now, right? Is it New well, Zealand? They don't supposedly have any, they, the, the disease is not present not there, there. right? Because they shut down immediately, yeah. um, and you know they're far away too, and they're a pretty small population. But you know Auckland's very dense, but they did it, and and they're they have an amazing leader. She's pretty awesome. Um, she's my politics, but that's look, what we I should have done, right? We should have shut down immediately, right? Of course, but I mean, look, yeah. we have a lot more complicated politics than they do. And you can have great leaders on the right and on the left. I mean, it doesn't really matter. In these moments, you just have to have a leader who knows what the hell they're doing and knows how to lead the country. Like Trump. We simply, well, we, I mean, <laughs> to be fully fair, I, I, we don't. Uh, it's very clear from the evidence. I, unless you're just a political hack who like, loves their party and it decides to have motivated reasoning, there's no question that he's a failure as a leader on every level. And that he's a terrible leader for the United States in particular, right? Um, it's so complicated to talk about, but like, I'll just leave you with this on this subject. And no, it's, a whole nother, it's a whole other topic right there. <laughs> yeah, I'll just, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say this. I think that we as a country are going to have to make a choice about whether we're going to live and tolerate each other, even if we disagree about things we think are important and aren't, because other things are more important, like pandemics, safety, infrastructure, basic decency. Those things matter, right? Or if we're going to live in this 
intolerable and not, I don't think, it's not a nation state, right, that can live like this, but an intolerable idea that everyone who isn't exactly like you is, un, is, a, is a miscreant traitor to the cause, right? And that's just not going to work. I just don't think we can live like that. I think it's overhyped. I think we're really pretending that we're very different from each other. Now, look, I, I think it's racism, and bigotry, and the rise of that, again, is it's besides the point. That's like beyond the pile. We can't tolerate that because that is a fracturing of the country, at the basic nature of its foundation, because we've tried to progress from that. And we can't go backward. But like we, we're not able to muster a response, right? Part of the problem is we just don't have people who are all on the same page. And I find it really worrisome. I think we've had bad leadership. We're less of a path forward now than other countries. We seem to be dumber on, on aggregate than we have ever have been. And that's more because of process than individual stupidity, although we are also stupid. Um, but there are stupid people everywhere, right? Like Russia is full of stupid people. So is Brazil. So is India. So is every freaking country. So is New Zealand. New Zealand must have plenty of stupid people. But like they had the right leader at the right time and she did a great job. So anyway, the point is, I think they're going to start shooting again. And um, now, do you feel good about that? Or are you a little bit worried going back to set? I mean, everything, right? How do you, A, I think it's safer there for sure. I think they have just better procedures. They've been yeah. smarter and more advanced and more scientifically oriented and led correctly to believe in that. Their society's also more, you know, I think intelligent and more educated than we are. Um, but you know, uh, there's no question that going back into a soundstage with hundreds of people as an actor who can't wear a mask when you're shooting, that's not exactly, I mean, I got to get on a plane and go down. I mean, there's a lot of things, but look, every life has risk in it. And I've been very safe. I have not been going out. I've not been seeing friends. Even other people have been. I have my ex-girlfriend is my neighbor to some degree. We see each other six feet apart like a couple times a week and just say hello, just for some human contact. Um, but I'm generally in my apartment doing my work and uh, keeping it clean, you know, <laughs> which seems to be a gigantic preoccupation of my life. But um, I, I think that it is worrisome. It's, it's, it's an unknown. I don't think anyone should pretend that either they know more about it than they do or that it's not a problem. It is a gigantic problem. It is materially, deeply unknown. It's substantially new. We are running a risk every time we contact each other and deal with it. It's, you know, <laughs> it's cyclical effects on people seem to be quite extraordinary. There are all kinds of other effects besides the respiratory disease we're learning about. I don't think we should be panicked in the knees and like freaked out all the time. But at the same time, I don't think we should be reckless. I think we should be wise and listen to the better knowledge we have rather than just denying it with some amateur idea that, Science doesn't matter. <laughs> I agree. I love Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I just, I just had one last kind of question for you to kind sure. of sum things up for, for this. Um, and even you kind of sort of touched on it, but yeah, obviously you've, even from my perspective, you work with, you know, three of the, if not best filmmakers ever. Um, and you've obviously worked with some really big name talent that we can all recognize. Out of all those projects and all those things you've done, what do you feel um, is the most valuable piece of advice that you've gotten from those things? And what are you most proud of? Um, the most valuable piece of advice, I think. <laughs> okay. This will not be from those directors necessarily, but I will say I use it in all those movies. And that is that you have to know what the event in a scene is always. And that that event is the most important reason why it's there. It's what makes the scene work. And you got to know that. Everything comes from that to me. Like if, if you don't understand that, then you don't know why it's there. And then there's a million things that come after that. Right? Like you have to be caught by it. You have to not know what's going to happen. Blah, blah, all the, you have to be able to be available, right? And you have to be technically sound. So that's what piece of advice I'd say. At least that's a useful piece of advice, put it that way. And what am I most proud of? You know, I guess that I set out to become an actor and that I heard a lot of great advice along the way. I learned so much and so much was put into me and given to me and so much love was poured into me by so many artists and teachers that 
I got here and I have a career and I'm a working actor and that's, it's a tribute to them. And that impulse on my part in my hard work, of course, but that doesn't really matter that much. It does. It's fine. But um, it's a tribute to the people who gave me a chance, people who taught me and people who invested in me and believed that I could be a part of the work of the future, you know, when I was young. And all the directors and writers and people I've worked with in my profession that are a proof of that faith from before and their faith in that moment too. And I'm most proud that people trusted me with that and gave me a shot and that I was able to equip myself well enough, and not maybe excellently, but well enough that I have a career as a working actor and um, that my faith is in that. I love it. That was great. Guys, great conversation. Delia, All right, thank, guys, that was thank, awesome. Thank you, man, for uh, coming and sharing your story. Yeah. Um, Thanks a lot, Dilip. Appreciate it. Yeah, cool. Dude, uh, when you, when you uh, win the first Academy Award, I hope you come back. Come back and tell us <laughs> about it. I'm serious. Yeah. We're big sure. fans of you, man. Thank you for doing this. You're yeah. very welcome, guys. Take care. Nice to see you.